The movie begins in Lay Market, Ladakh, with tension hanging thick in the air as a man grapples with the bomb's fatal embrace. Enter Major Samar Anand, the protagonist of our tale, a fearless bomb disposal expert, from the Corps of Army Engineers. Without any regard for his safety, he approaches the bomb and kneels down in front of it. His comrades, awestruck, watch as he approaches the bomb, devoid of any cumbersome protective gear. Why? Because Samur is no ordinary soldier, he's a legend in his own right, having defused a staggering 97 bombs prior to this, and this one is going to be his 98th. The soldier is in awe, and comments that this is the reason Samur is called the man who cannot perish. Samur executes his task with precision, diffusing the bomb with a flare that leaves onlookers breathless. With the crisis averted, Samur nonchalantly orders the reopening of the market before roaring off into the horizon on his trusty motorcycle. Yet, amidst the adrenaline-fueled chaos, Samur's thoughts drift to a different realm, the tender memory of his first love, a flame that refuses to be extinguished. Pausing by the tranquil shores of Pangong Lake, he sets up camp. With a flicker of nostalgia, Samur retrieves his weathered diary, and pens down the tale of today's harrowing encounter with finality's embrace. At dawn, we see a girl running towards the lake, her excitement palpable in the crisp morning air. She sets up her camera, undresses, and jumps into the cold water, but turns out that the waters are deeper than she thought and she begins to drown. Just as panic threatens to consume her, a silent savior emerges from the shadows, Major Samur Anand, he rescues her from drowning, drapes his jacket around her trembling form, and offers solace in the form of a warm cup of tea before melting away into the morning mist. Later, she is showing the video of her diving into the lake to his friends, boasting about how this was nothing for her, leaving out the parts where she almost drowned. Turns out her name is Akira Rai, a spirited filmmaker whose thirst for adventure knows no bounds, and she did this stunt to win a bet. While they all are messing around, their boss, Catherine, arrives. Upon her arrival, Akira goes up to her, asking about her request to accompany them. But her dreams of accompanying Catherine to London are shattered by a single curt rejection. Fuming with frustration, Akira goes back to her room, only to be met with another unwanted intrusion, her persistent ex-boyfriend, Arjun, who still can't understand the fact that their relationship is over. With a frustrated sigh, she disconnects the call, shedding Samur's jacket in a fit of irritation and tosses it aside. But as something falls from inside it, she stops and looks closely. Turns out, Samur has accidentally left his diary along with his jacket. Intrigued and unable to resist the allure of the unknown, Akira embarks on a journey of discovery, the pages of Samur's diary offering glimpses into a life shrouded in mystery and intrigue. As she reads, we are taken back in time to the bustling streets of London. Samur states that his life started the day he saw Snowfall for the first time, and when he saw her, Mira, in the snow. Mira rushes inside a church, where she complains to God about this sudden snowfall. But then she goes on, talking about her exam results and how she has made her dad proud. Mira implores for divine intervention, a fervent plea to thwart the inevitable union with a suitor she's yet to meet. As she gets in her car and drives away, Samur watches from behind. But he is interrupted when a man arrives and shouts at him to get his work done and shovel the snow. Later at his place, which is nothing more than a small room, Samur has breakfast and wakes up his roommate, Zane, who complains that what is the need to wake up so early, when they don't even have any work to do. Samur laughs, picks up his guitar, and sets out into the bustling streets, singing a Punjabi song. That is when Mira notices him and smiles his way. Days blur into weeks as Samur navigates the labyrinth of odd jobs, each endeavor a means to an end in the pursuit of sustenance. From scrubbing cars to haggling in fish markets, Samur's journey is a patchwork of eclectic experiences. One day amidst the bustling chaos of the fish market, Samur shows one of his customers a special kind of seafood, which earns him an unexpected offer, a job at a restaurant. Eager to seize the opportunity for a fresh start, Samur eagerly accepts, bidding farewell to his former occupation with a sense of newfound purpose. Samur begins his new job as a waiter, and as fate would have it, Samur's journey intersects with Mira's once more, this time amidst the jubilant celebrations of her engagement ceremony. He smiles at her and continues doing his work. Later when he is taking out trash, he finds Mira sitting outside, smoking a cigarette. She recognizes him from singing on the streets. He comments that maybe God didn't listen to her, and that is why she is getting married. Shocked, she says that it is bad to eavesdrop on others' confessions, and clarifies that she isn't getting married to that man from the party. Her fiancé, Roger, is a nice man, she has known him for years and is happy. In a moment of raw honesty, Samur challenges Mira's complacency, questioning the authenticity of her smiles. There is a silent acknowledgement of the truths left unspoken before the intrusion of a friend interrupts their conversation, shattering the fragile connection between them. A few days later, at the office after a meeting, Mira's father comments that he will become a lonely person after Mira's wedding. But she just smiles and says that it is not going to happen, since Roger will be living with them after marriage, a declaration that sends shockwaves through them. 
Both men look at her with shock, but she leaves saying that this is non-negotiable. As dusk descends upon the city, Samur finds himself counting the day's earnings when Mira reappears, arrives, and offers him 500 pounds, for one hour of his time, daily for a month. Turns out she wants him to teach her how to sing, since her dad is from Jalandhar and had always wanted her to learn how to speak Punjabi. And now at his 50th birthday, she wants to sing for him. But Samur, ever the pragmatist, refuses to take money from her. Instead, he strikes a deal that he'll teach her how to sing, and in return she'll teach her English. She later goes to the church and begs God to help her in Punjabi and in return she will never smoke. As the days pass, they both begin to learn together, with her practicing her Punjabi in free time, and him practicing her English at night. Amidst the backdrop of their language lessons, they unearth the depths of each other's souls, their vulnerabilities laid bare in the sacred space they've carved out for themselves. He even helps with her volunteering work, turns out she believes that if she will give to other, God will bless her with more and that is why God has never let her down. One day she finally sings the song perfectly, but Samer still thinks it isn't enough, because she sings with a lack of passion overshadowed by the weight of societal judgment. With gentle encouragement, he implores her to embrace the joy inherent in her music, unburdened by the scrutiny of others. He says that she should enjoy her songs, and that is what makes an impact. He then picks up her phone, makes a call to his friend, Maria, and tells her that he would be bringing Mira to their party tonight. He then leaves saying that Mira should enjoy her life at least for once. Later at night, Mira arrives with Maria to the spot, dressed differently than her attire of a sweet girl. As Mira sees people dancing, she gets excited, sheds her inhibitions along with her jacket, and gets on the dance floor. Samer, captivated by her grace, joins her on the dance floor. They dance all night, not caring about the world or what others will say. In the dimly lit embrace of the night, they find solace in each other's arms. After their wonderful time at the party, she thanks him for giving her the best time of her life. Amidst their conversation he confesses that he has fallen deeply in love with her. Her smile falters, heart heavy with the weight of unspoken truths. But when she tries to say something, he cuts her and says that their one-month contract is over, and now they both will go their separate way. The end of their story. As she gets up to catch her train, Samer seals their fate with a final kiss, a silent testament to the depths of his love and the impermanence of their shared sanctuary. Finally, at her father's 50th birthday party, she sings a beautiful Punjabi song, making her father cry. With the passage of time, Mira and Samer both get busy in their lives, a palpable emptiness lingers, a void that no amount of busyness can fill. Yet, fate, ever the capricious orchestrator, intervenes once more, bringing them together in a moment of serendipity. But his happiness ends when she delivers the crushing blow of her impending marriage to Roger, a decision dictated by filial duty rather than the whispers of her own heart. She then tells him the story of how her mom ran away when she was a little girl, and from that day her father has been her everything, and now she can't let him down. She then takes him to the church, and they both make a promise that they will always remain friends, and will never cross this line. He walks her to her house and leaves with a sad smile on his face. A few days later, a glimmer of hope emerges. Mira receives a gift from her mom, Pooja, along with a letter. Turns out that it is a wedding dress, the same dress Pooja wore to her wedding. In the letter, Pooja confesses that since the day she left, she buys gifts for Mira on her every birthday and writes a long letter to accompany them. But in the end, she always stores them in a cupboard but this time she wasn't able to contain herself. At the end of the letter, Pooja asks for forgiveness, and tears stream down Mira's face. Heartbroken, she visits Samer and asks for his advice on the sudden appearance of her mom. She finally makes up her mind and decides to visit her mom. Upon seeing Mira, Pooja bursts into tears, and they both cry in each other's arms. Pooja then tells her that she got married at the age of 19. His husband, Mira's father, was always nice to him but she never fell in love with him. But when Mira was four, she met Imran, and fell in love. Pooja couldn't leave her baby behind, so she stayed. But when Mira turned 14, Pooja wasn't able to stop herself, and ran away with Imran. They both look at Imran having fun with Samer, and Pooja says that he is crazy for her. As Pooja's whispered confessions fill the air, Mira's heart softens, her once bitter resentment giving way to a newfound understanding of the woman, who chose love over convention. Later, Mira thanks Imran for loving her mom, but in return he thanks her for coming back in Pooja's life, because now she will never stop smiling. Before leaving, she asks him how he was able to wait for eight long years, and how was he so sure that one day he and Pooja would be together. He smiles and responds that he has faith in his love, and that time stands no chance in the face of love. With the weight of the past lifted from her shoulders, Mira embarks on a journey of reconciliation, her heart brimming with newfound compassion for the woman who dared to defy societal norms in pursuit of her own happiness. And amidst the bittersweet symphony of love and loss, Mira finds the courage to seize the fleeting moments of happiness that dance within her grasp, and her confession echoes through the quiet confines of a quaint coffee shop. 
She leans in and kisses Samur, the world fading in the background. As the sun breaks the horizon, Samur and Mira are having fun as always, unaware of the impending storm that looms on the horizon as Samur drops Mira off at her friend's birthday bash. She tells him that she would be talking to her dad today about their relationship. Samur is excited and confident that there is no way her dad would not like her decision. But when he leaves, he is met by an accident. As he falls to the ground in the blink of an eye, Mira's prayers pierce the heavens. In that critical and life-changing moment, she strikes a bargain with fate, vowing to sever their ties if only it means sparing Samur's life. The paramedics assist him into the ambulance and as the ambulance drives away, Mira stands alone, her heart heavy with the weight of her sacrificial pact. Four days later, Samur is back home with a fractured arm, but an overall healthy appearance. But amidst the physical pain, a deeper wound fester, the absence of Mira, a gaping chasm that threatens to swallow him whole. He thinks that maybe her father is upset at her for falling in love with Samur. But right at this moment, they hear a knock on the door and find Mira standing on the other side. Samur's heart swells with a mixture of relief and apprehension. He complains about her absence, but she says that she was not gone, she was praying for his life. He laughs at her cuteness, questions what she gave up in return of his life, and her words shatter his illusions. He sits up in the bed, shocked, but she stands up saying that she believes that if they were to get together again, his life would be in grave danger. Hence, she came today to inform him that she is marrying Roger, and wants him to leave this city and go far away. Later at night, when Zane comes back home, he finds the place in complete darkness. Upon turning on the light, he finds money on Samur's bed along with a letter. As he reads, he finds out that Samur has left all his money to him and is going back to India. Samur asks him to make something big of himself, and one day he will come back to collect his share. The scene switches to Samur, with his belongings packed, sitting in the church. Samur makes a solemn vow, a declaration of war against fate itself. Since he believes that God stole his love from him, he will now steal Mira's faith in him. Since she believes that as long as they are not together, he will be safe, so now every day he will embrace demise and they will see who wins this war. He gets up, leaves, vows to defy the gods themselves. And that was the day he decided to become a bomb disposal expert. Back in the present, Akira closes the diary, her eyes filled with unshed tears. As a tear breaks free, she makes up her mind to go meet Samur. Luckily, he is still at the lake. She takes a leap of faith, returning his jacket with a grateful smile etched upon her lips and thanks him for saving her the other day. He gets to leave, but she stops him and gets too excited about his love life. She begins questioning why he hasn't gone back to London, and when he doesn't respond, she comments that she never cries, but his story made her sentimental. Undeterred by his stoicism, Akira muses aloud about the complexities of love. But when there is still no response, she comments that maybe this all was a fragment of his imagination which he wrote down. At this, Samur offers her a cryptic warning to regard his story as nothing but fiction and move on. As Samur drives away, Akira looks at him with fascination and makes a call to her boyfriend, Arjun. She asks him if he will wait 10 years for her, but after hearing his negative response, she laughs and breaks up with him, thinking that love is what Samur did with Mira. Determined to carve her own path, Akira sets her sights on a new challenge, convincing her formidable boss, Catherine, to greenlight her passion project. Through persistence and unwavering determination, she secures Catherine's reluctant approval, but on the terms that Akira will handle everything on her own, and will get no assistance from the team whatsoever. Akira agrees to the terms, and squeals in excitement. The scene switches to the army barracks in Pahalgam, Kashmir. The commander-in-chief can be seen talking to Samur. He informs him that they gave permission to a girl to make a documentary on the bomb disposal squad, and specifically his success stories. They believe this is a chance to showcase the valor of the bomb disposal squad through the lens of a documentary. With the weight of expectation resting upon his shoulders, Samur accepts it. As Samur sits down for lunch, he's taken aback to find that his shadow on this mission is none other than the spirited Akira Rai. She smiles and Samur sighs. Despite his initial sigh of resignation, the day unfolds with surprising camaraderie as Akira swiftly bonds with the members of the bomb squad. The next day, he goes on a critical mission and lays down the law, outlining strict safety protocols for Akira to follow. But Akira being Akira, ignores these rules and accidentally gets herself into trouble. But before anything can go wrong, Samur's instinct to protect kicks in, saving Akira from harm's way. After she is out of shock, he shouts at her for irresponsible behavior, saying that her reckless behavior could have cost them their lives, and orders her to go back. She resists but he doesn't budge and asks her to forget about her documentary. At this, she snaps and says that just like he can't forget Mira, she cannot and will not forget her documentary. He sighs and agrees to take her further. After doing the day's work, they all settle down in camps, when Akira sees Samur leaving. One of the bomb disposal officers, Christian, tells her that Samur always goes to some peaceful place after defusing a bomb, and this excites her. She picks up her camera, rushes after him, and finds him sitting by a stream, singing. Later at night, she watches the recording, and thinks about how easy it is to fall in love with him. 
She then takes it upon herself as a challenge, that by the end of these two weeks, he would be singing Punjabi songs for her. The next morning, while playing football, a mishap with her camera leaves Akira disillusioned, resigned to the belief that her project was doomed from the start and she was just taking a one-time chance. She then gets up to sleep, and before leaving tells Samer that this would be her last night with them, and her entertainment ends now. Later, as she packs up to leave, she is greeted by the others, with her camera in their hand. They inform her that Samer stayed up all night and fixed her camera. His unexpected act of kindness reignites her hope, prompting her to confront her fears and pursue her dreams with renewed determination. Later, while defusing a bomb, Samer even lets Akira take shots from up close. As he defuses the bomb, she begins talking and as their time together draws to a close, she finds herself falling for Samer's quiet strength, his laughter a beacon of light in the darkness that surrounds them. He laughs at her funny talk, and that is when this new love story begins. They begin spending more time together, and he starts smiling and laughing. On their last day together, Akira asks him one last question to wrap up her documentary, about why he never wears protective gear while defusing bombs. At her question, his eyes fill with sadness, and he goes on and says that the protective gear is to save life, but he doesn't want that because his life itself is a torture. As he gets up to leave, Akira confesses her feelings, her heart laid bare before him. He stops in his tracks, turns around and finds her standing with tears in her eyes. He lovingly touches her face and begs her to not fall in love the way he did many years ago, because her smile lights up the whole world. The next day, she bids everyone goodbye, but when it is time to bid Samra goodbye, she says that he should stay safe for the sake of their deadly love story. He laughs and leans in to hug her, but she stops him and comments that friendly hugs don't work for her he should either give her a kiss or leave it. He laughs and kisses her on the forehead. As the moment Akira had long awaited finally arrives, she eagerly shows her film to her boss back in London. Tears glisten in Catherine's eyes as she watches, moved by the powerful story captured on screen. With a heartfelt vow to ensure the documentary's release, she delivers a condition that hangs heavy in the air. Samer must verify his story in person, or the film will never make it out of the edit room. Leaving the office with a mix of hope and trepidation, Akira calls Samer, informing about the approval of her documentary, but as he congratulates her, she drops the bomb that to make her documentary go live, he would have to fly to London. Her heart sinks as she delivers the ultimatum, knowing all too well the weight of the request she's making. Samer's apology is a dagger to her hopes, leaving her with a hollow ache in her chest. A week later, Akira is in the cafeteria. Having lunch with her friends, Samer's unexpected call sends her heart racing. She rushes out and spots him standing across the road, a beacon of hope amidst the chaos of London. With a rush of emotion, she runs into his arms. But in a cruel twist of fate, tragedy strikes in the blink of an eye. As Akira moves backward in her joy, Samer's vigilant gaze catches sight of a car approaching towards her. With selfless instinct, Samer throws himself into harm's way, taking the impact meant for her. Samer is rushed to the hospital and is immediately taken in for surgery. As he lies in the hospital bed, Akira's heart shatters into a million pieces. Despite the success of her film, the only thing that matters now is his recovery. After several painful hours in the hospital, Samer finally wakes up. Akira goes up to his room. But the first thing he asks about is the whereabouts of Mira. His desperate cries for Mira pierce her soul, leaving her adrift in a sea of sorrow. Heartbroken and devastated, she leaves the room, tears falling down her eyes, but vowing to remain steadfast by Samer's side, come what may. The next day, Samer stirs in his hospital room, greeted by the arrival of his doctor, Dr. Khan. To check if he is fully conscious, she begins asking him random questions about himself. Only to be met with a startling revelation, Samer believes he's 28 years old, a decade younger than reality. His diagnosis, retrograde amnesia, a cruel twist of fate that has robbed him of the past 10 years of his life. She summons Akira to her office, breaking the devastating news. She states that he remembers everything up to his first accident, which occurred 10 years ago, but what happened after that, has been wiped off. The worst of all is that they cannot tell for sure that whether he will be able to recover or not. But they need to find the people he remembers, clinging to the hope that familiarity might be the key to unlocking his lost memories. At night, as Sam rests peacefully, Akira sits by his side and promises that no matter what, she will never let him forget her. Determined to help him reclaim his lost memories, she embarks on a mission to track down the key figures from his past. Her journey leads her to Mira's doorstep, where she finds her immersed in the joy of her daughter's birthday celebration. Not wanting to disturb this personal moment, she retreats, biding her time for the right opportunity to broach the delicate subject of Samer's past. But the following day, Akira finds Mira at her office and asks for a moment of her time. But since they have never met before, Mira apologizes and asks her to make an appointment with her assistant. As she turns to leave, Akira shouts that she is here to talk about Samer. The mention of Samer's name halts Mira in her tracks, stirring long-buried emotions. They both go out, sit in a park and that is when Akira lays bare the truth of Samer's condition, imploring Mira to help bridge the gap between Samer's past and present. 
Mira agrees to go help him and meet the doctor. At the hospital, Dr. Khan underscores the fragility of Samer's mental state, cautioning against any actions that might trigger further trauma. After 10 long years of wait, Mira finally sees Samer lying in his hospital bed. She sits down next to him, and he embraces her instantly. And as she leaves his side, her emotions overwhelm her. Seeking solace amidst the quiet solitude of a nearby park, she cries her eyes out. The next day she comes visit him again. He says that the last thing he remembers of his time before the accident is Mira, resplendent in a pink maxi dress, watching him perform daring stunts on his bike. But after that everything is black. His doctor informs him that the accident he is talking about happened 10 years ago. Despite the doctor's assurances of his eventual recovery, Samer grapples with disbelief and panic, struggling to reconcile the lost decade that eludes his grasp. Clutching Mira's hand tightly, Samer confronts the stark reality of their supposed marriage, his heart heavy with the weight of ten years' worth of forgotten moments. Through tear-filled eyes, Mira confirms his assumption, her own grief mirroring his, as she navigates the delicate balance between truth and compassion. Later, Mira meets with Akira, revealing her decision to play along with Samer's delusion, determined to shield him from further anguish. But Akira, torn between empathy and practicality, questions the morality of perpetuating such a charade. It's then that Mira unveils the truth that she never got married. Roger is just her friend and since he is divorced, she helps him plan his daughter's birthday every year. She then says that she has always loved Samer, and will always do, but she can never be his. At that moment, beside the tranquil waters of the lake, Akira and Mira forge a solemn pact, bound by their shared resolve to restore Samer's shattered memories and reclaim the life he's lost to the shadows of amnesia. Later, they both go to find Zane, who is now successfully running a restaurant. They explain the situation, and asks for his help. His unwavering commitment to his friend's well-being fuels their determination, as they join forces in a race against time to piece together the fragments of Samer's fractured past. The following day, Zane accompanies Samer back to his home. On their ride back, he informs him that they have their own restaurant, a bungalow and a car. The reunion of old comrades is heartwarming, yet tinged with the poignant reality of Samer's amnesia, casting a shadow over their shared history. As Zane bids his friend farewell at the doorstep, Samer is greeted by Mira's welcoming embrace, a gesture laden with unspoken sentiments. Later in the quiet of the night, he comments on how it feels like he is meeting her after so many years. But she just hugs him, her silence a testament to the complexities of their intertwined destinies. Come morning, she wakes up, and when she sees Samer lying by her side, overcome with desire she leans in to kiss him, but stops at the right moment and controls herself. Later, she visits Dr. Khan and Akira, and states that she can't do this drama anymore. Akira's impassioned pleas for perseverance fall on deaf ears as Mira stays persistent. Dr. Khan supports her decision and says that it is time that Akira meets Samer, doing so might trigger his memories and bring him back. Thus, the stage is set for a fateful encounter. Zane takes Samer to an interview, saying that the reporter wants to cover their success story. He drops him off at the church he first saw Mira at, and urges him to go in. Samer finds himself drawn to the familiar sights of his past, his senses tingling with a haunting deja vu as Akira approaches on her motorbike. As she introduces herself, he asks if they have met before or not, but she replies that they haven't. After the interview, he sees her bike and comments that it was his favorite bike and requests if he could ride it. She laughs and hands him the keys. He takes Akira out on a ride of London, taking her to all the places he has ever worked at. At one moment, he even says that he is scared of bombs and guns, eliciting a bittersweet smile from Akira as she navigates the depths of his inner turmoil. As dusk descends, Akira and Mira meet up to discuss the progress. She comments that the major Samer she used to know was a shadow of the person she met today. Samer lives to love Mira and that's it. Without her, his life was dull and colorless. She then says that even in her own dreams, she is miles behind Mira in this race for Samer, and before he remembers and says that he wants to be with Mira, she is distancing herself from him, because the reality is that she may never hold the key to Samer's heart. She leaves by saying that Mira left Samer for his life, but he won't survive without her now, so maybe it is an indication for her to go live her life with him. The next day, Samer is in the park, jogging, when Zane calls him to remind him of the location of their new restaurant, and that he needs to be there. However, fate has other plans in store. As Samer reaches the train station to board the train, he hears announcements about a bomb on the train, and that everyone needs to evacuate immediately. In a moment of clarity, memories long buried resurface, propelling him towards the danger instead of away from it. He enters the train and successfully defuses the bomb. When asked about his name, he replies reclaiming his identity as Major Samer Anand. Later, adorned in his finest attire, Samer stands in the solemn serenity of the church, awaiting Mira's arrival. When she enters, confusion etched on her face, she asks what's going on. With poignant sincerity, he professes his desire to marry her once more, his words cutting through the silence. But when she tries to leave, calling all of this an absurd joke, he stops her by confessing that he remembers everything. As he releases all of his pent-up feelings, she just stands there, crying. 
He leaves the church, saying that he is going back to India, because where he has survived 10 years without her, he could survive a hundred more. With a heavy heart, Samar bids farewell to London. His journey back to India accompanied by Akira's unwavering support. At the airport, he says that on his final bed, he will ask God for another life, just to love Akira. As he gets ready to leave, they cry in each other's arms for the love they can never have, and go in opposite directions. In India, Samar resumes his life's calling, navigating the perilous landscape of bomb disposal with unyielding determination. One day, after his mission, he finds Mira waiting for him. In a moment of raw vulnerability, she lays bare her heart, that he wasn't the only one bearing these ten years, she also agonized every day. She then says that it took her this long to realize that God didn't save him to be without her, but he was saved for her. That time wasn't theirs, but this is, and she will love him till the end. Their conversation is interrupted by one of Samar's team members telling him about finding another bomb. As he leaves, he implores Mira to wait, promising a future unbound by the constraints of fate or divine intervention, a future where their love is the sole guiding force. On the other side of the planet, as Akira concludes her documentary, The Man Who Cannot Perish, the air is charged with a sense of profound revelation. She says that this isn't a story of courage or bravery, it's the story of the undying love a man had for a woman. She says that she started this story thinking that this would be her one big ticket to fame, instead she found true love on the way. And as she speaks, Samar defuses his last bomb, not because he is suddenly scared of the end, but because it is his time to live, to love. It is not a story of miracles, she said, it is a simple story of love. And as the curtain falls on this extraordinary tale, Akira's words linger in the air, a testament to the enduring legacy of love's indomitable spirit. For in the end, it is not the miracles that define us, but the simple, profound beauty of love's unwavering presence in our lives.